So this session, we're going to be considering run with obedience, or we could say run with faith. But run with obedience. Running is actually believing. So when, when you read that, or when you hear that, you should actually take that word run as simply the, Im the earthly imagery of the heavenly reality of believing. Our understanding of belief corresponds to and correlates with our understanding of salvation. And if we have misunderstandings concerning salvation, we're going to have misunderstandings concerning belief. <clears throat> Some Christians insist that believers can stop believing in Christ Jesus and forsake him, but even then remain saved. This may alarm you, but most Christians who believe that faith in Christ can cease also insist that all who forsake Christ without repentance will perish eternally. But there are those who insist differently. Other Christians account for those who forsake Christ by distinguishing between two kinds of faith. Counterfeit faith that fails and authentic faith which perseveres. And that's how I would see the matter. So it is evident that not all believers agree concerning the nature of belief or faith for which the gospel calls nor how faith correlates with obedience and good works. This is so even among Protestant Christians who affirm justification by faith alone. Precisely because, as we shall see, this slogan can be somewhat ambiguous and we need to um, clarify that. The objective of this presentation then is to show how the gospel binds together faith and obedience. <clears throat> Christ calls us to run a race that has consequences far greater than running a race for winning the gold or silver or the bronze and because our race is in the arena of faith. The prize is singular, it's eternal life. Or described in other ways, resurrection unto life, salvation, and various other terms. But the only alternative is eternal perdition. The only alternative to running this race is perdition. And yet the life we pursue already courses through our mortal bodies by God's spirit. For as affirmed in the prior presentation, while eternal life is the victor's wreath, resurrection of life, the last day, already invigorates believers to run the race with perseverance. Resurrection life is God's promised reward for all who persevere to the end. Resurrection life is God's promise, but also a reality that is now ours in some real sense. The first presentation concerns the eternal value of the prize to be won. This one features, this presentation features the way we will win the prize. The only way to win is to run the race set before us in this arena. It is the way of faith, for without faith it is impossible to please God. And everyone who runs in this race must believe that God exists and that he rewards all who pursue him. Yet faith neither brings anything 
nor adds a solitary thing to God's gracious salvation accomplished in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. So before we proceed, it is important to clarify what is meant by the way we win the prize. The way under consideration here is not the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who pioneers and perfects our faith. What Christ accomplished is the objective basis of salvation. The presentation that I'm making now concerns the subjective means by which we receive salvation, the way salvation in Christ becomes ours. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we will receive the prize of eternal life won and accomplished by the Lord Jesus in his own race on this earth. <clears throat> now, as we enter into this, we need to consider faith and reward. No single passage in all of the scriptures provides the fullness of the meaning embodied in the word faith or belief or the verb believe. But Hebrews 11.6 is instructive. The passage features two elements. First, it provides a window on what the day of judgment will be like for believers. <clears throat> it speaks of being justified before God because it speaks of pleasing God and of God's rewarding those who seek him. Now, the word justified is, justification is not used in Hebrews 11, but the concept is nonetheless there. It speaks of being justified before God because it speaks of pleasing God and of God's rewarding those who seek him. And the only way we can please God is in Christ. God commends only those whose conduct is governed by faith in him. For faith is the way one pleases God. God's commendation includes forgiveness of sins, for he makes no mention of their sins. In all of the tabulations of, Hebrew, of Hebrews 11, there's no mention whatsoever of the sins of these individuals. <clears throat> for example, God does not mention Noah's drunkenness nor Abraham's lying. God commends all who believe in him. God's commendation, which is opposite condemnation, refers to justification before God. God's commendation or justification is his approval under the scrutiny of his discriminating judgment. No mention at all of any of their sins is what believers should anticipate on the day of judgment. And let me just pause there for a moment. When I was growing up as a young man, teenager and young man, uh, it was popular for people, for preachers, to um, threaten people with terror by saying that, that in, the day of, in, the, in the last day, God is going to play a video or a movie of your life for the watching world to see, and we, will, and we will all just melt in shame as we watch and observe our lives being played out, and everybody's going to see all of the sins that we've commit, committed. And in the end, <clears throat> he's going to wel welcome us into the, um, into the, into the, the, what they would say was into heaven, um, nonetheless. Well, that is not at all the portrayal that we find in Scripture. What we find in Scripture is this, is a record something like Hebrews 11. As a matter of fact, I would make the case that Hebrews 11 is exactly the kind of thing that we ought to expect. That God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, 
enter into the kingdom of God, um, and not, so, not a solitary mention, not a hint of our sins. Why? Because justification, which is already ours in Christ, which anticipates justification of the last day, or forgiveness of sins, which is already ours in Christ, which anticipates the forgiveness of sins in that day, means that he's not going to bring up sin again. To bring up sin again would be double jeopardy. And he's not a double jeopardy kind of God. Now the second feature in Hebrews 11.6 is the author's description of the kind of believing that receives God's commendation. All who please God believe, one, that God exists, and they too believe that God rewards those who seek him. God commends all who see through the veil of the visible things to understand that things, un that things seen are made from things unseen, Hebrews 11.3. And that visible things testify that God exists. Yet there's more. For everyone who approaches God must also believe that he rewards those who seek him. So Hebrews 11:6 6 substitutes seek, which is figurative for believe. Those who seek him, those are those who believe in him. Seeking, in, in other words, is the imagery for believing. <clears throat> Faith is God's is God focused for faith is an active quest for him. It's a seeking after him. It's a pursuit of God. Yet faith acts with self-interest. For everyone who comes to God must also believe that he rewards everyone who seeks him. Lest anyone misunderstand the connection between faith's self-interest and God's reward, it is important to recognize two common errors concerning the words, he rewards those who seek him and clarify the nature of the reward. First, faith does not earn God's reward. Faith is simultaneously God-centered and self-interested. There are people who, who actually believe and teach that the gospel does not allow for any self-interest whatsoever. Well, what, well, why do you believe? <laughs> believe in order that you might be saved. That's self-interest, is it not? And of course, people who teach that kind of thing confuse self-interest with selfishness. Selfishness is an altogether different thing. Selfishness is sinful. Self-interest is, is a God-given God quality that is, that is necessary to the preservation of life. And so, faith is simultaneously God-centered and self-interested without contradiction or competition because self-interest is not to be confused with selfishness. Faith's self-interest is satisfied not by pursuing God's reward as something to be attained by merit. Rather, faith's self-interest attains fulfillment by seeing God who rewards all who seek by seeking God who rewards all who look, look for him. Therefore, the gospel's call appeals to faith's self-interest by commanding Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. <clears throat> now, lamentably, there are evangelicals, as I hinted at earlier, who formally embrace the, Re the Reformation motto, sola fide, that is by faith alone, but gravely diminish it by reducing faith to a solitary and naked act of assent to avoid any perceived intrusion of merit into salvation, they take the word alone, in, by faith alone, to mean justified by faith alone as an adjective that describes faith itself as naked. Charles 
Stanley affirms, even if a believer for all practical purposes becomes an unbeliever, his salvation is not in jeopardy. And he's a very famous TV preacher. Artie Kendall, who followed, um, in, who followed in the wake of uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones at the chapel in London, insists, what if a person who is saved falls into sin, stays in sin, and is found in that very condition when he dies? Will he still go to heaven? The answer is yes. Kind of shocking, actually, isn't it? Stanley and Kendall and others contend that faith in its solitariness justifies. Faith in its nakedness justifies, and once justified, it's, it's done. Nothing, nothing uh, certainly you can abandon faith and, and still, still enter into the kingdom. And they take, they take alone then as an adjective describing faith, which is quite different from the historic Protestant understanding of that expression justified by faith alone, which takes alone as an adverb that describes how we are justified, not, describe, not an adjective describing faith. And thus, to avoid mistaking alone as describing faith, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead, James 2, it is not uncommon for evangelicals to explain this way. We are justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is not alone. Naked or dead faith does not justify. James 2.17, only an active or obedient faith justifies, Galatians 5.6. God justifies believers not because of what faith is, nor because of obedience that inescapably accompanies faith, <clears throat> but because of Christ Jesus in whom obedient faith rests with full confidence and assurance. It is not the reliability of faith itself that justifies, only the reliability of faith's object, Jesus Christ, grounds our justification before God. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Both Luther and Calvin reason from scripture that eternal life is God's promised reward to all those who, who are obedient in faith in Christ Jesus and persevere in him. And they argue that this relationship of faith and reward is not one of merit. Luther engaged in that with uh, Erasmus. Calvin engages that also in his writings. And they argue that this relationship between faith and reward is one of ordered sequence, not the cause of salvation. It's, the, it's a relationship of ordered sequence of salvation rather than the cause of salvation. The Roman Catholics at the time took, took it the other way, cause of salvation. God established that belief and unbelief should have their fitting consequences. Nothing is clearer than that a reward is promised for good works to relieve the weakness of our flesh by some comfort, but not to puff us up or to beat our, not to puff up our hearts with vain glory. Whoever then deduces merit of works from this or weighs works and reward together wanders very far from God's own plan. That's a quote from, uh, I believe, Luther. Therefore, when Hebrews 11, verse 6, states that God rewards those who seek him, it does not mean that we merit the reward. What is the reward according to the context? It is God's commendation, 
or to put it another way in biblical terms, is his justification of us. By faith, each one named received God's commendation. Mention of Abel and Enoch is interrupted in Hebrews 11 to explain that even though Genesis does not expressly use faith or believe to describe these two men, and it doesn't, their faith is nonetheless manifest by the fact that God commends them. As a matter of fact, the word believe, the verb believe, is used only one time in Genesis. Do you know where it is? Genesis 15, 6. So what the writer to the Hebrews is doing is he's, he's inferring from the descriptions of Abel and Enoch and the others that they had to believe because God commended them. God's commendation necessarily means that they believed. They believed him. They sought after him, and the commendation is the reward. This explains why verse 6 in Hebrews 11 momentarily interrupts the recitation of the ancients who believed, who are commended by God. The writer of the Hebrews finds that the biblical text implicitly indicates faith in both stories because without faith, no one can please God. And that's his explanation. Because the author of Hebrews knows from Genesis 15, 6, that faith is essential for pleasing God, he reasons that both Abel and Enoch receive God's approval by faith. Now, some contributions from Hebrews 11 then also. Hebrews 11 indicates to us faith receives God's reward of salvation. If stating that all who come to God must believe that he rewards those who seek him indicates that faith entails self-interest without any hint of meriting God's favor, mention of God's reward in Hebrews 11.6 also refers to God's salvation, not to a reward in addition to salvation, but salvation itself. And this is for three clear reasons. First, God's word to Abraham. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Genesis 15.1. This informs the principle of Hebrews 11.6. The Lord, who is Abraham's great reward, rewarded his faith with justification. The reward is utterly disproportionate to the faith. It is not merited in any sense of the word. It's a reward, but it's a reward in the sense of what Luther and Calvin argue, the ordered sequence of salvation. Second, Hebrews 10, 35 through 39, they, they, these verses clarify that a reward is not given in addition to salvation. Therefore, the writer to the Hebrews says, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, that is perseverance, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming age will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and and, and preserve their souls. Confidence here in this passage is simply another way of speaking of faith. Confidence has great reward, and this reward is God's promised salvation. Now finally, in this passage, the reward of Hebrews 11.6 is salvation to be inherited, as Hebrews 1.14 speaks of. The reward is righteousness, which Noah 
was to inherit, Hebrews 11, 7. The reward is the promise which Abraham, Abraham, with all his descendants of faith, is to inherit, Hebrews 6, 13 through 17. The reward is the heavenly Jerusalem, spoken of in Hebrews 11, um, multiple times in 12, the first uh, in verses 22 and following, and again in Hebrews 13, verse 14. We are to imitate Abraham, and we <clears throat> desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope unto the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and perseverance inherit the promises, Hebrews 6, 11, and 12. Like Abraham, we who are to inherit the promises must have enduring faith in God who confirmed his promise with an oath. Again, Hebrews 6, 13 through 20. Faith's object, Jesus Christ, is the reward that God gives to those who believe and who seek him. God, as Abraham's very great reward, seems to be a figure of speech in which, well, or, or used as a figure of speech, in which the source of the reward stands in place of the reward to be given. That is, God himself is the reward. So commendation or approval is the reward God gives. Likewise, the reward for, from God for which Moses looked in fulfillment of the Lord's promised, an, promise announced to Abraham, a homeland, a better country, the heavenly city. Yet, because all of this is fulfilled in Abraham's singular seed, who is Jesus Christ, it all coheres in him, so fittingly who sums it all up as God's reward. To gain Christ, as Paul speaks in Philippians 3, verse 8, is to receive everything that he embodies. Justification, salvation, eternal life, redemption, sanctification, adoption, the full measure of God's promises. And we can go on and on in the language of the New Testament to, to exalt and exult in it. Failure to gain Christ is to lose everything. This is why John Bunyan urgently admonishes in his shorter version of, that, very, that resembles the Pilgrim's Progress but is called the Heavenly Footman. John Bunyan urgently admonishes, <clears throat> they that will have heaven, or to use New Testament language, they that will have the, the kingdom of God must run for it. And he warns, because if thou lose, thou losest all, thou losest soul, God, Christ, heaven, ease, peace, etc., etc., etc. Faith that saves is trust in Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord. Saving faith is the enduring look to him, the resurrected Christ, whose atoning sacrifice is the only source of life by which we are enabled to do what is pleasing to God. By faith in Christ Jesus, we receive God's commendation. <clears throat> Scripture portrays, now, now I'm going to move on to speak of the inter, interaction between faith and faithfulness. Scripture portrays faith as resting from one's works as God rested from his, Hebrews 4, 9 and 10. But it also speaks of faith not only as a resting from our own works, but a striving. And you say, well, aren't those contradictory? Well, not, not in the way that the writer to the Hebrews is thinking. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one fall by the same sort of disobedience as the children of Israel. Striving is simply an, an earthly imagery for believing, trusting, 
Rest, resting in Christ is believing. So, so resting, an infant resting in one's mother's arms is a great picture of what it is for a Christian to rest in Christ. But we who rest in Christ must strive. They're not contradictory. <clears throat> Faith that perseveres receives God's commendation. So, Faith, as, as Hebrews portrays it, is a pursuit of God, a resting in, in uh, his promises, but it is a persevering pursuit of God. And the reward is all that is in Christ Jesus. Faithfulness is a proof of faith. It is the evidence of belief. And faith, there is a relationship, I'm, skip, I'm going to have to skip some here, but there is a relationship between faith and understanding as well that we must grasp. Another element in Hebrews 11 beckons belief, our brief attention and it is this, the relationship between faith and understanding Hebrews 11.3 states this, By faith we understand that the worlds were created by the word of God, so that what is seen came into existence from what is not visible. God established the relationship between invisible and visible. In these things, invisible and visible, things grasped only by faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of what is not seen. Everything God made bears his signature. Things seen display the splendor of things unseen. For God made visible things analogous to heavenly realities. So Paul affirms that God has given a universal witness to his eternal power and his divine nature for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since creation, the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And the principal point then of Hebrews 11 here on this matter makes it clear that by faith we understand that the things we see are temporary images of the things which are unseen and permanent. The created things we see will be shaken in the day of judgment. And only those things that cannot be shaken will endure. Hebrews, 11, Hebrews 12 verses 25 and 26. By faith we taste the powers of the age to come as we dwell in the present age, Hebrews 6, 5. By faith, we understand that the visible things, the visible tokens that God has given us function for us as the promised land did for Abram and his descendants in Israel, as reminders of greater things to come. For visible things are signs pointing away from themselves in two directions. One, upward to, he to the heavenly reality of invisible things, and two, forward to the coming age when all good things that we do not yet see will be ours. Hebrews 10.1. Of believers who set their hope upon unseen things, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Hebrews eleven sixteen. Now, as we saw with regard to as with, with regard to salvation, all kinds of earthly imageries portray God's heavenly realities of salvation in Christ. So too, earthly analogies 
represent and portray for us the true nature of belief and what is our obligation in order that as we seek God that we might receive the promise. <clears throat> because scripture portrays faith with numerous imageries, saving faith is like a finely cut, multifaceted jewel. <clears throat> Here are a number of the imageries that I'm going to speak of, but I want to uh, speak of this also in terms of a jewel. Faith is like a multifaceted jewel. No single biblical imagery adequately describes faith's nature or function. Even the word faith itself does not adequately describe itself. As seen already, faith is simultaneously a resting and a striving. As For example, Paul presents Christian faith in pursuit of the prize of salvation with several words and phrases that describe how we must run the race to win. We must run in such a way as to get the prize. We must go into strict training, Paul says, and not run aimlessly, but with purpose. Elsewhere, using the foot race imagery, Paul says, I press on, Philippians 3, and I strain toward the goal. He admonishes, compete in the good competition of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called and for which you, may, you made the good confession before many witnesses. Paul states that eternal life is the prize to be won by running after it with athletic vigor and athletic resolve. Because athletic imagery and imageries depicting the Christian life fill the New Testament. They are prominent throughout our book and also throughout my presentation. Scripture uses at least six groups of imageries to portray Christian belief. Athletic, military, rational, sensory, bodily action, and endowment. And I have slightly different words there. But I, before I leave this um, gem imagery, I want to simply speak to that and what the point of that is. Belief or faith, Christian faith is like a finely cut gem. <clears throat> and a finely cut gem is, is enhanced in its value and its splendor and beauty and glory by the number of facets it has. Faith is like a gem that is finely cut with multiple facets. And these facets are simply different ways that faith is being described. And, and that's the point that I want to underscore here. When we read the New Testament and we read these kinds of words, it's, it's speaking about faith. It's not speaking about something other than faith. It's speaking of faith. So it speaks of faith in terms of running a race. It speaks of, of faith by using the word seek. It speaks of faith by using the word rest. In other words, <clears throat> in other words, you and I must never fall prey to this very grievous notion that a concept is married to a single word. <laughs> that is not true at all. And you know it from the fact that you speak and you use multiple words to describe a concept. And so when we read the New Testament, and the Old Testament too for that matter, we need to recognize that belief, 
is being portrayed for us in a variety of ways. Here are a number. There's the gem, and here are facets. All of those are simply descriptions of faith. They're substitutions of the word believe. And that's what we must understand. They're simply substituting for the word believing, or belief, or faith. So the athletic imagery is, is an imagery that captures effectively, and this is why Paul uses it so well, and other, others do too, it, it captures effectively the nature of faith. That faith is active, it's aggressive, it's a pursuit. So that when Paul speaks of laying hold of eternal life, I press on, he's talking about believing. But the believing is not some kind of passive repose. It's an aggressive pursuit of Christ. And the athletic imagery then is exceedingly rich, especially in Paul's letters. <clears throat> Paul likely, I, I, sincerely, I sincerely believe that Paul never made it, never went into any of the athletic arenas when the events were being held. Why? Because the athletic arenas in those days, the Olympiad and the various other ones, there were four of these in, in Greece. Um, another one, for example, in... Um, near Corinth, the four are these, Olympia, Pythia, Isthmia, and Nemea. Those four, they all had Olympic-style stadiums, and athletic events were held there, and every one of these athletic events was held in honor of and homage to deities which is precisely why Paul never would have ever attended these events. The Olympics, the modern Olympics, are coming very, very close to that, are they not? Um, the, the opening ceremonies uh, are becoming increasingly religious in nature. Paul did not attend them, but he knew very well the athletic arena. Paul was in arenas, but not for athletic events. He was in arenas uh, facing enemies in hostile uh, crowds. But Paul uses the, the imageries that come out of the arena, including racing and boxing and various other athletic events there, effectively to, to sketch what belief and believing entails. We train, in, we train, as Paul says, train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. <clears throat> I do not visit a gym, and you can probably tell by my grand physique, um, but if I did, if I were to attend a gym, I would use this verse as, an, as a um, contact point for evangelism. Um, ask, ask people, why are you uh, training at a gym? And uh, their answer is going to be, of course, uh, rather rather vague and, uh, and pointless because why do, people, why do people train athletically? To win a perishable crown <laughs> um, that's fleeting or to maintain a, um, an athletic physique for as long as you are actually engaged in training. It's a grand avenue for us to engage people in evangelism. 
and bringing the gospel to them because it is an imagery of, some, of a far grander training, training for eternity. The exhortation then that Paul uses here, train yourself for godliness, which, which comes out of 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. This exhortation calls for the kind of training athlete, athletes endure in their quest for the gold medal. Training that pushes the believer to the point of pain to attain strength, stamina, and endurance in pursuit of eternal life. And may I linger here for a moment. As we observe the ever encroaching fist of opposition to Christians, do we not need to train for, God, for godliness ourselves in order that we might be able to stand against the temptations that are going to come our way and are already coming our way to cave in and to surrender and to yield to, to those who would impose their wills upon us? Christians have had to do this all through the, the centuries. You can read about some of them, such as Polycarp in the second century, who was one of John the Apostle's disciples. They had to face these things, or, or, um, or various other ones. Martin Luther himself faced hostilities of, of enormous kinds. He was blessed to die a natural death. Um, John Calvin as well. Paul the Apostle. We need to train our faith muscle, as it were, in order that we might be able to resist the temptations to yield when the, uh, when the persecution comes. As with the athlete, endurance training of faith entails three aspects. First, we as Christians must never slacken the discipline but be vigilant to sustain the exercise of faith as Timothy was, in, uh, was engaged, as we see in 1 Timothy 4, 6. Second, the believer must keep in mind that godliness is not the ultimate, but the penultimate objective for, for rigorous spiritual training, as Paul says, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. Not a gain of worldly wealth, but a gain of eternal life. One must pursue godliness to take hold of eternal life. Godliness is not an end in itself. Godliness finds its end in the great reward. Third, Paul's admonition does not let us settle upon the athlete, the athlete's well-toned body and the believer's godlike character. Training for godliness is not, as I say, an end in itself. For while godliness holds promise of life for the present, it holds the promise of life to come. Paul clarifies what he means when he says, but exercise yourself for godly character. For though bodily exercise is profitable for a little while, godly character is profitable for all time because it holds a promise of life now and for the coming time. So as a coach, Paul motivates believers for to this end, we, to we toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.10. So we enter into this arena where the contest of faith is a daily engagement and we're pursuing the victor's crown. Now, 
I'm going to turn to um, military imagery and speak about military imagery a little bit as well, just to point out the, uh, how Paul uses it. <clears throat> this is the charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them, by them who may wage the, <coughs> excuse me, who great, <coughs> that by them you may wage the great warfare, holding faith and good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. You must engage in this good warfare, the imagery coming of, out of military. Why is, there, why is there warfare and why are there wars and why do we have military in this age? Uh, well, there are many reasons, but one of the chief reasons is because God ordained it as an imagery of the greatest battle that is going on. In other words, every conflict that we have here in this age is an imagery, is a representation of the greater battle, the greater war that is going on between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, between the domain of Satan and the kingdom of God. And so out of that come the imageries of warfare, military, armor, swords, and so forth. So that the imagery that Paul draws upon is the imagery that is um, quite evident and quite apparent and, and altogether very real among us. Of course, Paul's imagery is the imagery that comes out of the first century the imagery that may come out of our century is bigger and louder and, uh, and maybe even more terrifying given, uh, given the noise that it makes and the threats that it makes. Now, another imagery is the imagery of the mind. The imagery of the mind. Um, according to the Gospel of John, Belief in Jesus Christ is reasonable. Belief is rooted in undeniable evidence. So John uses the verb to know interchangeably with the verb to believe. This is evident when he uses the verb to know or to understand paired with to believe as Peter confesses you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter is not simply repeating himself. He is, in the second portion, we have, come, we have believed and we have come to know. The, the, the coming to know is descriptive of believing. <clears throat> it isn't two different things. It's the same thing described in different ways. And we, and we find this throughout uh, John's Gospel and throughout the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to leave that one and move on to sensory imagery. Sensory imagery such as seeing, um, which is an imagery for believing. And we find these throughout the Gospels. Why does Jesus give sight to the blind? He's giving sight to the blind as a, as a parable, an acted parable, to show that to see is to believe. And, and how does one come to see? Well, not by one's own power but by the power of him who gives the sight. And of course, the point is, how does one come to believe? How does one come to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Well, not by one's own power conjured up, but by receiving it as a gift. Belief is a gift. It's given to us. And so we see Jesus giving sight to the blind. Why do we have eyes? 
our eyes themselves are gifts from God as earthly imageries that remind us daily that we must trust in him who gives sight, who gives belief. And I could develop that, but I'm going to um, have to um, forego that. Instead, ears. Why does God give us ears? Ears are for hearing the word of God. Even though John's gospel does not include an account of Jesus' opening deaf ears, as the synoptic gospels do, they, John's gospel does speak of Jesus opening eyes, but he doesn't include a miracle of opening deaf ears. The imagery of hearing reverberates throughout John's gospel. So the gospel begins with a theme of heavenly speech. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was of God, and the Word was God. Thus, to hear Jesus speak is to hear the voice of God. Jesus announces, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So to hear the word is to hear God's voice. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So while the Gospel of John doesn't include a miracle of healing by giving, the, giving ears to the deaf, it has much to say about the imagery of hearing as believing. And, we, and I could um, give you an example, for example, Lazarus. Deaf people don't hear. I recently visited um, my parents' tombs in, our, in my hometown. And uh, I was alone, but that didn't, that still didn't uh, prompt me to say, come forth! Um, Jesus did, and the deaf, the dead man Lazarus heard. The very fact that he heard is itself a miracle. The miracle began before he walked out of the tomb. The miracle happened when, he, when the deaf heard. Well, of course, isn't that exactly what Eric is doing here week in and week out and what others of you are doing week in and week out, calling the dead to hear, to hear the gospel. That's what Jesus is doing as well, calling upon the dead to hear, calling upon the deaf to hear. Bodily action is another imagery that we, uh, that we see. And John's gospel is rich on this. Coming, coming to Christ. Coming is an imagery for believing. And other, and other act, bodily actions that we might point to. And another one, another imagery that we could point to would be disciple imagery of following after the, the, the concept of a disciple from the first century and how Jesus calls people to be his disciples. That is an imagery of believing, disciple making, making of disciples or making disciples out of people. That's, that is an, an act that entails believing or another, another imagery that we could point to would be reception imagery. To receive Jesus Christ is to believe Jesus Christ. And John speaks like this. Um, he speaks like this in the, in the prologue to his gospel. But as many as, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the, the children of God. Receiving is simply a substitution for believing. He could have said, to as many as believed, but he didn't. He used the imagery instead. 
And this is what we need to understand as we're reading the scriptures and we come upon these imageries, what we have to recognize and understand is that they've simply substituted one word for another. <laughs> Running, receiving, hearing, seeing, tasting, resting, all of these are imageries for believing. So as I have suggested, Christian faith is like a finely cut gemstone. It is multifaceted. Saving faith is multidimensional, is, the, is a multidimensional act that entails the whole person, the whole being. Thus, Scripture uses numerous imageries to portray faith's origin, nature, and action. And these imageries define faith. To believe in God who rewards whoever seeks him is to receive in advance a taste of the glorious salvation of the age that is to come. So even, the, even the, another imagery that I haven't uh, included, but taste and see that the Lord is good. Believe. The very, the very, the very act of tasting so that, so that embedded in all of life, even the eating of food is the imagery that God has designed. If food is delightful to the palate, how much more so is Christ to the soul. Belief is to, belief is to compete in the good competition of faith. To run, to land blows on one's body, to look to the sun for life, to eat of his flesh and to drink of his blood, to hear and to follow his voice. All these and more provide contour and texture to our understanding of what faith entails. At once, these imageries call us to act in obedient faith to the heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus, and they provide a standard by which we may be assured that we truly believe in the Son of God.